talked about that last week. We talked about being a game changer. And in the newspaper on Monday morning, it said, Deshaun Watson, game changer. I was like, man, they came to church yesterday. They must have saw us and what we do. But since 2002, many of you Texans fans know this. That since 2002, we have been struggling to find a quarterback. I mean, we've had a great offensive line. We've had a great defensive line. We've had a great secondary. We've had great linebackers. We've had great receivers. We've had great running backs. But we have yet to have a great quarterback. But Deshaun Watson has come, and he has changed the game. And he has shown us in the physical, how in the supernatural, how we should be game changers for Jesus Christ. Amen. And so it's so exciting to know that there is a game changer that's playing on Sunday. And that's all carnal. That's all, you know, stuff that you guys keep up with, that social media hype. But what makes a game changer a game changer? Well, the main thing is that they change it. Say that when we say change it. In order to be a game changer, something has to change. You cannot be a game changer if nothing changes. If you show up week after week to your jobs and to your homes and nothing shifts, nothing changes, then you're not a game changer. Or you're not activating the game changer that's inside of you. So we've changed the game with church. We, we've changed how we present the gospel to the masses. We change how church is done. Yeah, we have helmets on stage. We've got smoke. We've got lights. We've got all of those things. All of that is just to enhance the message of Jesus Christ. We don't compromise with the gospel, but we believe that there are some fun and attracting things that we can do to make sure that your life throughout the week, that you remember these sermons and that you remember this experience. And so it aids you in your life. So do we have church events that we want to invite you to? No. All of our events go out to the community because God didn't tell us to go into the church and invite people. He told us to go and be the church. And so last week, uh, this past week, we went to High Towers football uh, game uh, across the street. And we're, we're praying for those guys there in a character building season. Uh, it's been a tough one. It was homecoming and they lost that game. But we're continually lifting those guys up. And one of the people that was with us, she was like, man, those kids was cussing so loud and they was doing all kind of crazy. I said, that's why we're here. Because if we're not here, then we cannot infect them or affect them because we're inside the church. And so we even had one of our little kids going up to kids and say, hey, I don't want to see your underwear. Can you pick your pants up? And the guy pulled him up because he was a game changer. One of the little kids here, he's a game changer. And so we're thankful for that. And so we, we, we dress in a different way to reach the masses in a modern approach. Our target area for people in this church is lost people. People that have lost their way are people that don't know Christ and don't know how to come to Christ. That's what this whole thing is about. And so when you come here, we don't bicker and fight about, well, this is my seat or this is my area. No, this is for lost people. And if more lost people come, we'll give up our seats just so that their lives can be changed because we care more about salvation and lives being changed than we care about being comfortable in church this morning. So we are a church for lost people. Don't ever forget that. We are a church for lost people. We're a church for who? Lost people. And our mission and vision is to do what? We got it. We got it. Well, as we get ready to go into the Word of God this morning, I'm going to recap from last week. If you could stand on your feet, uh, we'll look at Second Chronicles chapter 23, verses 1. And that'll be our springboard scripture just to kind of connect last week's message. Last week, did y'all have a good time with the message last week? I mean, last week, oh, everybody preached the sermon. Everybody was a part of that. It was very interactive. It was excellent. And so we remember this, Athaliah. What did I call Athaliah last week? Little Liar. Okay, you remember. Good. It says this. It says, in the seventh year of Athaliah's reign, Jehoiada the priest decided to act. He summoned his courage and made a pact with five army commanders. Let us bow. Father, we just ask, Lord, that you give us the ability and the mentality to act today that we will develop the game changer inside of us in order for us to change the game in a mighty way let us change households let us change communities let us change schools let us change work environments let us change atmospheres father let us be atmosphere shifters because you've designed us to do those things so father i pray that you Uncover the inner game changer in everybody today that we may see Christ and they may see Christ in us. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated across the building. Thank you so much for standing and appeasing me for that. So you cannot have game changer without the word change. Something has to 
change. Things are going to change. Things are always changing. Things are always moving. Things are always shifting. But you can't be a game changer if nothing changes. And so these are a couple of questions that I want to ask you this morning. What things need to change to be better? What things need to change in order to be better? Things can change for the better or they can change for the worse. Things can, things can change with you or without you. So the personal question is this. Where do I need personal change? Not where I need to get somebody else straight, where do I need to fix somebody else, but where in my personal life do I need to change? So my wife, uh, y'all see my clothes. Uh, my wife came home with some shopping bags and she told me to turn my, my, my back around and she said, hey, uh, kids, tell daddy to close his eyes. And she came in with two bags of clothes and she pulled out all of these clothes and she was like, look, I got you a new look because you keep wearing the same kind of clothes all the time. Thank you so much. Thank my wife for looking out for me. So she said I needed to change, and I don't mind changing as long as I am going forward and developing in the way that God has me to develop. And so I said, okay, I see you taking a shot at my stylistic, you know, point of view. I thought my button downs and my, my clothes were adequate, but guess not. So she has changed the game for me, and I'm thankful for her. So we can give her a round of applause for changing me and keeping me in line. The second thing is, what do I need to change in my bloodline? Like, did you grow up in a single parent home? Uh, was your father there but absent? Was your mom dating other men? Was there no structure? Did you guys eat and watch TV at the same time? I mean, what things did you do that you could possibly change? What things do you want to change in your bloodline? And then the third thing is this, what am I called to change in my generation. So in 2017, in this space, in this place, in this year, what is it that I have been called to change? So the number one thing that game changers do is game changers, they do what others don't do. So let's look at this, Acts chapter 6. Now Acts is when the church first started. I mean, if you look at Acts and Acts chapter 2, that's when the Holy Spirit came down, the people were speaking in tongues, and they was like, man, these people must be drunk. And uh, Peter was like, well, how can these people be drunk? It's early in the morning. And so we, we had this, these people uh, coming together, 2,000 people, the church is growing, everybody's packing in, they're worshiping God, and then there is a change in the atmosphere. The widows, they weren't getting food. And you guys know how it is when y'all get hangry, you don't get the food that you need, you need a Snickers, whatever it is that you need, you, you, you're not getting what you need. They start to bicker, they start to grumble, they start to, to, to complain. Anybody ever been to a place where people just complain all the time? I mean, I used to work in an environment, I used to be a teacher, and we had some people that would complain. All, I'm like, man, just do it. They're not going to change the teeks. They're not going to change it. It's going to be that way, just do it instead of complaining. But this is how the church was. They came to the church where they're supposed to be feeling good, and now they are complaining to one another. So I'll read it like this. It says, but as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of the food. So the twelve called a meeting to all the believers. They said, we apostles should spend more time teaching the gospel, uh, reading the word of God, and praying instead of running a food program. This is church. We're not here to run a food program. We need to get some people that can run this food program for us. And so they selected seven people. And the seven they, they picked was Stephen, a man full of faith, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas of Antioch, an early convert to the Jewish faith. These were the seven presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them and said, you guys are now going to be over the food program. How many people do we have here over the food program in the church? All right, so we need some people that's over the food program. That's an area of opportunity because game changers, they see where there's a need and they do it. How many of y'all enjoyed the donuts this morning? Anybody get you some donuts on the way in, got you a bag of donuts? We order those every week for you. Somebody has to pick those up, somebody has to pay for those, somebody has to set those out, and then somebody has to pass them out so that you guys can enjoy those donuts. 
Because that's what game changers do. They see something, they see how they can impact a life, and they do it. They change the game. What did Nike say? Just do it. Don't ask questions, just do it. That's what game changers are all about. Anybody uh, president of a corporation, or you're over a business, or you're over a nonprofit, you do things and you're looking to hire people? I promise you this, as a, as a person that's over business and over church, I look for people that just do it. Not come ask me questions, just, just get it done. You see if there's an issue, you don't have to run to me and ask me anything, just get it done. They're looking for people that can just do it, get it done, and change the game. And so just like Stephen and these seven guys, they were chosen because they were able to do stuff that other people weren't doing. As the quarterback of the Texans, Deshaun Watson can do something that none of the other quarterbacks can do. He can run the ball. So he's a double threat. He can throw and he can run. And when you have a double threat, it's harder for the defense to know what you're doing, but he just does it. Nobody can teach him how to do that. It's just in him. And so when you think about your household, when you think about your apartment complexes, or you think about your work, when you see something or you want to say, man, that is out of place, or do you just do it? So on this stage, is everything aligned right? Can anything be changed? You can call it out. Everything is good? Huh? The helmets are uneven? So what should we do about it? Just do what? Game changers don't tell people to do it. Game changers change it. So what needs to be done? There we go. That's a game changer right there. This is a game changer. Give her a round of applause. She's changing the game. Thank you so much. What's your name? Jalicia. Jalicia, thank you so much for changing the game for us this morning. She is changing. You can bring it. Look at that. Come on, give us some hand clap. Give us some, give us a, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Look at her. Instalettos. Changing the game. That's how you change the game. That's what I'm talking about. There you go. Thank you, Jaleesa. Jaleesia, right? Jaleesia. Jaleesia is a game changer. And she's here this morning because she's changing the game. And so we can learn from that because it's easy to sit back and tell people what they should do, but it's another step to get up out of your seat, out of your comfortable, and say, I'm going to move and change the game. Because that's who God has called us to do. Not just to sit back and look at a generation that's falling, but to look at a generation and say, you know what? These kids need help. These young adults need guidance. These people need mentors. They need people to love them. They need supporters. And not just talk about it while we're drinking coffee or hanging out at Starbucks, but get into the schools and go to the parks and play with the kids because they need game changers in their life. A fact is that they said that millennials are not inside the church. They're not there. Now, that's a little bit different from here because we have a lot of young people here. But it's still a whole lot of people that said in their bed sleep right now. But the thing is, who's going to go get them? We pass by them every day. But it's only up to us to change the game for these people. So Inspiration Church, whole mantra is to love, live, and lead. And we want to love the lost. We don't talk about people. You understand what I'm, we don't talk about what we can do, we do it. And that's what makes you a game changer because we're developing that inside of you today that you will just do it. You will make it happen, you will do it. In the early church, it became a personal thing of treatment. And so there needed to be some order in how people were treated and the only way that there can be order in the church is that people have to understand the word of God so that they can be able to live out the word of God. The Bible says, blessed are the hearers and the doers. So not the people that just come and they listen, it's the people that get up and they walk it out. South side walk it out, east side walk it out, Fresno walk it out. Missouri City, walk it out. Houston, walk it out. Pearland, walk it out. At your job, work it out. In your school, walk it out. In your home, walk it out. We don't take a break from being game changers because he's a di- he designed you to do that. Now, here's the great thing about this man named Stephen. Stephen, he was one of the seven that was picked to be over the food program. Does that seem like a real spiritual thing? No. We, th- we think about spiritual gifts. We want somebody to speak in tongues. 
We want to see somebody that can pray in the name of Jesus, bring down the heavens. Or we want somebody to be able to preach. Or we want somebody to be able to lay hands and heal people. But here Stephen has been assigned to pass out the donuts. See, this is what happens. When you, when you start to do stuff, God shows you who you are. When you start to do stuff, when you start passing out donuts, when you start passing out invitations, when you start passing out uh, programs, when you start uh, helping with the kids, God will start to show you things about yourself that you've never experienced in your whole life. So here this, here this guy is, his name is Stephen. And Stephen is over the food, over the Shipley's. He goes and picks up Shipley's, brings it to the church, and he's passing it out. But in the midst of his passing out these Shipley's donuts, he is now being confronted with the old school Christians. Now let me talk about the old school Christians. See, the old school Christians would have a problem with what I got on. So if you got a problem, then you are old school Christian. I love you. But they're not coming to the church for old school Christians. You're an old school Christian if you say, I don't know why they got all that stuff up there. They don't need all that smoke. All they need is the word of God. The word of God, didn't, Jesus didn't have all of that stuff. That's an old school mindset. Because in a life, in a day of marketing, y'all, you, y'all know y'all are, y'all, are, y'all are inundated with marketing all the time. Like commercials, billboards, uh, bumper stickers, t-shirts. I mean, all day long, people are sending messages, sending messages, sending messages. Some catch your eye, some you don't see. But the ones that really catch your eye, they worked. So as believers, as people that want to be inspiring and inspiration to others, we do things that catch people's attention so that we can hit them with the word of God. Because I'm with you, the word of God doesn't change. They may change the translation, but guess what? The meaning is still the meaning. And so as, as, as Stephen, it says this in verse 8. It says, Stephen, a man full of grace, of God's power, performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. But he's over the food program. How is he doing these things and he's supposed to be passing out food? It says, but one day some of the old school Christians, freed slaves as it was called, started to debate with Stephen on how he was passing out the donuts. So Stephen is in combat with these people, going back and forth about what's happening. And it says this, it says this in verse 11, it says, From Cyrene, Alexandria, Sicilia, and the province of Asia, none of them could stand against the wisdom and the spirit that Stephen spoke. He went from being a food program passer out to now God is using him to speak to these people in a way that they've never been spoken to before. Why? Because he was around the game. You can't be a game changer until you start getting in the game. So when he got into the game, now things have started to change. And now they're seeing that game changers don't think. They think what others won't think. So his mind has shifted. Because here these old school Christians, they have been in the word, they're in the synagogue. These are Jewish people. They've read the scrolls. They've read the scribes. They've done all of these things. But here Stephen is speaking wisdom, speaking truth to them that they never heard before. Because when you allow God to use your mind, he'll change your mind. But you don't know that until you step out into the deep. So there's, there's a visual of the ocean. And I'm a man that's on the beach. The sand is right here. The ocean is roaring. And I'm looking out at sea. Anybody ever seen Moana? And, and the, the sea's calling me. It's one thing to see the sea and to hear it calling you. And it's another thing to walk out in the midst of the sea. Nobody learns how to swim without getting wet. Nobody learns how long they can hold their breath underwater if they're not submerged in water. So the only way that you will know what God really has for you is to get wet. To say, God, I'm ready to take that next step of faith and get wet with you, God. 
I've been, I've been asking you for a bunch of stuff my whole life. I've been, I've been saying, God, give me this, do this for me. But guess what? It's one thing to talk about swimming, but it's another thing to go down into the water. So Colin Kaepernick, we've been talking about him because why? He's, he's, we'll know about Colin Kaepernick 10 or 15 years from now. He'll go down like Muhammad Ali. He'll go into the, the books as one of him because he started a movement. Did y'all know that in the NHL, the National Hockey League, there are people now taking a stand during the National Anthem? Because he's changed the game. But guess what? I don't think Colin Kaepernick knew that all of this would happen. I don't think he knew that he would be out of a job, that he would now cause the whole NFL to do something. Now NHL and now basketball is coming on. And now all of these different areas are multifaceted. He's now changed it, but I don't think he knew that that was going to happen. Because we don't know the impact that we have until we, until we do it. So you will be challenged when you step into your position. Last week at the Laia, she was the queen. And we had the young ruler who was supposed to be in that position. He didn't have to fight her for her position because it was his position. So as God moves you into position and as you take your rightful place, guess what's going to happen? God is going to change your singleness. So now your focus won't be on I'm alone. It will be on God, what can I do? And as you find out what God I could, God, what can I do? He'll send you somebody to help you do what you do. And before you know it, you'll be walking down the aisle hand in hand, kissing your boo because God has now connected you with your game changer. Stop thinking about what you want the end result to be and get busy and watch God change the game. Your marriage will not change with you talking badly about your spouse. Your, your children won't get better if you keep saying that they're how bad they are. It only happens when you try to exude what God has called us to do and that's to give love to the people. So next time your husband comes home cussing you out and you say, baby, I'm going to love you anyway, and he cusses you out even more and he goes to smack you and you say, I'm not going to do anything because I love you. And you keep on saying, I'm going to love you and you go fix his plate even though he's been bad to you. Then you're going to change the game. When your teachers are telling you to do certain things and you're being disrespectful, that's not going to change the game. That's normal. But it's up to us to walk in love so that we can change what God has done for us. And so in our occupations and personal decisions, you will be challenged by the people that you thought would support you when you start to become a game changer. Stephen is in the church passing out food and the leaders in the church come to debate Stephen about church stuff. What? you the same person that told me to get a job. I got a job. Now you're telling me I need to stay home from work. You're the same person that said, well, what you do today when you came home? And you've been looking for work and now you're mad because your food not ready. Anybody ever experienced that? I, me and my wife experienced that when we were first got married. Uh, she quit her job. And I was mad about her quitting her job too. And she was making about $525 every two weeks. But I was mad because she didn't have no money coming in after that. And I was like, man, you need to get a job. So anybody ever had a spouse that wasn't working, don't raise your hand because I don't want anybody to feel incriminated. But when you out working all day and you come home and you see them with the same pajamas on, kitchen not clean, dishes out, and you get home and the first thing that you ask is, well, oh, what'd you do today? All you're saying is, do you want to argue? Like, do you want to argue with me? Because what you're really saying is, I don't see you, did, you didn't do anything. But we don't know what happened in between time. In the meantime, all we know is what we see. That's kind of how lost people look. Like, we don't know what they experienced, but we want to correct their behaviors, but we don't know what they've been through. 
We hadn't seen them their whole life, but then we want to come in and tell them, do this, do this, do this, as opposed to loving them. You can't change the game until you love the person. And so we have to be mindful that we think, not like we think, but we think like a game changer. The Bible says, let this mind be in you that is also in Christ Jesus. Because it gives you the mental capacity to love people even when you feel like you shouldn't love them. But, Pastor, I, I, I struggle with that. I struggle with my temperament. I struggle with correcting people. I struggle with loving even when, when people are mean to me. I struggle with turning the other cheek. I struggle with respecting my daddy because he's not here. I struggle with loving people when they don't love me back. I struggle with that. And you know what? That's fine. Because on every journey, there's progress. But we need to celebrate the progress in order for people to understand that they are love throughout the process. So this is how we, we live with people. We live with them when we can show love to them. We don't stoop low, we rise up because that's what game changers do. So how do, we, how do we develop people at Inspiration Church? You're new here. This is a new place. This is a new building, new atmosphere. Some of y'all, this is your first time here. So how do we do that here? Well, we have I groups. If there's anything that you want to know in life, we have a group for that. So if you want to get better in marriage, guess what? We have an I group for marriage. If you like playing basketball and you like a little bit of the word too, we got an I group for that too. Or maybe you are too busy to meet with people. We got a group for you. You can meet on GroupMe and you can have your whole conversation and Bible study on your cell phone. You don't have to show up anywhere. You can be there. Or if you're a young professional woman and you want to be with other young professional women, you want to talk not about people but about good things, we got a group for that too. Or if you just, you're like, man, it would be cool if we had like a group where we could go out and just like mentor young, young boys in the neighborhood. We got a group for that too. The only thing you need to do to be a part of a group is to have three people. How many people do you need? Three. So if you say, I'm going to start my own group by myself, that's not a group. Sorry. That's just you, yourself, and I. But if you get three people, you can sign up for a group. So today we're starting out our groups. And after church, you'll have the opportunity to go over to the back, sign up, and guess what? Get connected. Even if you're one of those seasoned saints, you're like, man, I, want, I really want to study like a book of Mark. Or I really want to go deeper in the book of Luke. Or I really want to understand who God is. We got a group for that too. It's called Going Deeper. So whether it's a hobby that you're attracted to or you really want to get in the word of God because you're in a season and you need a fresh word, there is a group for that. And we want you to join in and be a part of those I groups. So here's the deal. Stephen, it said he was full of the Holy Spirit. Anybody know how to get the Holy Spirit? Y'all heard of the phrase, catch the Holy Spirit? Anybody ever heard that? I caught the Holy Spirit. What do you think about? Somebody give me your best impression of what it looks like when you catch the Holy Spirit. Y'all some shy people. See, if we, if we was at home playing dominoes, y'all be falling out, wiggling across the floor. That's not how you catch the Holy Spirit. That's how you get happy. That's how you have a, an emotional experience at church. But the only way that you can catch the Holy Spirit is by accepting Jesus Christ into your life. When you accept Jesus Christ, you catch the Holy Spirit. And when you catch the Holy Spirit, you can live these things out. It says, Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. Now, whatever you are full of, you will follow. So if you're full of the Holy Spirit, guess what you're going to follow? The Holy Spirit. If you're full of social media, then guess what you're going to follow? If you're getting full and all your messages on Facebook, guess what you're going to follow? The one thing that I can say that is an issue for millennials right now is YouTube. Because YouTube has been the sound doctrine teacher for a lot of people. People will talk to me and be like, yeah, I was watching this YouTube video and I, I learned that. And I'm like, YouTube? Do you know the part? No, but he be coming with some knowledge. How do you know? So I was having a conversation with the guy and he was like, well, you know, it all started with woman first. And after woman, the woman had man, and then man came back. So really, it's the woman that really is the head of everything. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he was like, I promise you, I got it off this YouTube. And I said, well, where did he get it from? And he was like, some books. And I was like, what books? And he was like, I'm going to check on that and get back to you. And I'm like, dude, what are you talking about? Because he's, he's following YouTube. 
He's thirsting for something. He's looking for something, but he's following what he's foot of. So, seasoned saints, everyone will get old, but not everyone matures. So, you could be 65 and still be a baby in Christ. Just because you got older doesn't mean that you're mature. And what about this? Think positive and proactive. Because I think that I can do it, but now I don't just think it, I'm moving on it. I can put the helmet in the position that it needs to be because I'm being proactive. And then the other thing about being a game changer is this. To every little fire, life fire, you always show up with two buckets. Anybody can know what those two buckets are filled of? One with gas and one with water. Because you may have to burn something down or you may have to put it out to preserve something. Here's another quote. Measure twice, cut once. What does that mean? How does that make sense to my life? That means that you don't just jump out there and act on anything. You have to measure it, measure your actions, measure your words, measure your thoughts, then act on it. Herm Edwards said this, he said, don't hit sin. In a social media driven society, it's easy to get frustrated with something and them little thumbs get to moving. Ooh, I mean, you going off. Don't hit sin. Hit backspace, 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 delete, 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 delete. Put your phone away. Because our first response in anger is typically not the right one. You can tear your whole family apart in the midst of being frustrated. So Stephen is, is with these guys and they're, they're arguing with him about the word of God and telling him that he's not right because he's a part of the church and they're in the synagogue and they're having these back and forth and Stephen is getting with them. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about salvation. He's talking about the Godhead, the Trinity. He's talking about all of these things and spitting it off to him and they look at him and guess what they do to Stephen? They stone Stephen. Saying that Stephen, is, he started out serving what? Donuts. And now he's in the midst of being stoned because God is using him to change the game. Now, I know some of y'all are like, that's not attractive. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be a part of the, uh, the donut ministry if it ends in death. But I can tell you one thing. You're only going to live maybe 120, I think is what the Bible, I know the Bible says that's the, that's the max of man's life is 120 years old. So if you didn't know that, you can go back and look in the word on that. You don't have to go check YouTube. You can go look in Genesis. 120, I would rather do something in this life that will be remembered for more than 120 years. So my impact is not just for my life. I want to be able to impact generations, thousands of years from now. And that's what Stephen did. He started serving donuts and now we're talking about him in 2017. So the third thing that happens with game changers is that they see what others can't see. So verse 54 says the Jewish leaders, this is Acts chapter 7, says the Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusation and they shook their fists at him in rage. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, because what you're full of, you'll follow, gazed steadily into the heaven and saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. He told them, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Then they put their hands over their ears and began shouting, we don't want to hear the truth. We don't want to hear the truth. Stop talking about that. Stop talking about that. They rushed him at him, 58 and they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats, laid it at the feet of the young man named Saul as they stoned him. Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. What did Jesus say when he was on the cross? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. When you start to follow the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now. Believe it. 
He's speaking to your, your household. He's speaking to your marriage. He's speaking to your classes. He's speaking to your mind. He's speaking to your bad habits. He's speaking to, to, to the way that you treat people. He's speaking to the negative things that you have and also to the positive. He's giving you elevation in your life right now. He's speaking to you because that's what the Holy Spirit does. Some of you are hurting and he's comforting you right now because that's what the Holy Spirit does. And so it says that Stephen, he saw, he was in the midst of being stoned and he saw hope. In the midst of tragedy. Stephen saw hope in the midst of tragic situations. So in Puerto Rico, what's happening right now? There's a big issue going on. Are they sending food out there? Are they getting supplies out there because it's not land? They have to take things over on ships. And then Donald Trump went out there the other day and they said that that didn't really go well. But there's tragedy happening. But he was able to see hope in the midst of tragedy. The president also tweeted this. He says, uh, we've been trying to negotiate with North Korea, and there's only one thing that we can do. You know Trump. He wants you to lean in. Well, what's that one thing? Are we going to war? Because that's what he wants you to think. But I'm here to tell you today that the worst thing or the best thing that you can do is to take action and get in the game. It's up to you to change it. And the only way that you can change it is you have to be able to see the silver lining in all of the dark clouds. Now, this is easy for some people. Some people, it's very hard for them to see good in the midst of bad things because they don't see it. And, and it's up to people. How many people that are just positive? You're positive about everything. Raise your hand. You're a positive person. We don't have no positive people in here today. No. Ooh, praise God. Y'all need to be in church. Praise God. All right. Well, I want to show you something. And some of you, you're going to get it right away. But others of you, it's going to take you a while to see it. So as they put this picture up on the screen, I want you, when you see it, call it out. What? Jesus, where is that? Y'all see it? Raise your hand if you see it. Who, don't, who still doesn't see it? Did y'all hear what just happened? There was about three or four people that got it at first. And we were patient enough to wait for the other people to get it. That's what salvation is like. That's what being a game changer is like. You got it already. But you wait for others to see the change in the game. Stephen saw Jesus in the midst of what looks to be like some little sticks or stones being thrown at him. So that visual can always show you that you may get it first, but we have to be patient and allow other people to get it on the way. Some people see things that I don't see. So I'll tell you a little bit about me before I close. Uh, I am not perfect and I need a lot of help. All right, I'll just put it like that. I am good at communicating with the microphone and speaking. When it comes to writing, I'm okay. I'm not perfect because sometimes I don't put my commas where they should go. I don't put semicolons where they should be. I don't put periods where they should be. Sometimes I forget to put a capital letter somewhere because I'm more focused on the message. So God hooked me up with this woman, right? And she's everything that I'm not. And she reminds me of that. So, to make this plain, my wife corrects me a whole lot. All the time. Like, all, like, all the time. Like, all, does anybody have a person like that in their life that they correct them all the time? I see that all, I mean, it's like, come on, let me breathe. But here's, here's what, I, what, what I like and I don't like. I hate being corrected because it does something to my pride. Because when you correct me, what you're telling me is I'm not perfect. And although I know I'm not perfect, I don't want you to tell me that I'm not perfect. Like I can tell you I'm not perfect all the time, but as soon as you tell me I'm not perfect, I'm going to have something rise up in me. But here's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit perfects you. And it corrects you when you're wrong. And I love my wife because she corrects me. I hate when she corrects me, but I love her for correcting me. 
because when she corrects me, I'm presented to the world in a different way. People can receive my message in a written format in a different way because she corrected me. Only a fool rebukes a person that corrects them, but a wise man welcomes the correction. So if my wife got to change my wardrobe so that I can do what God has called me to do, hey, okay, I'll take a shot to my pride, but guess what? I know we're going somewhere. You may have to be moved and repositioned in your life to move out of some areas and some places and some positions that you may not be that great at, or you may have to be encouraged to do it better. It's okay to be corrected because the Holy Spirit corrects. The Word of God corrects. It proofs you so that when you're presented to the world, they see perfection. You may not be perfection, but they look at you with perfection because you were corrected in the back room. The Holy Spirit helps us when we're weak. So I ask this question to you. Stephen followed the Holy Spirit. It led him to to die, but he, he saw the silver lining. He was dying, but he said, Lord, don't charge them with the sin because they couldn't see it yet. They couldn't see Jesus yet. They couldn't see it. So he didn't, he didn't cast it. They didn't see it. We didn't charge them. Do you know if you don't know what's going on in the Bible, you're not sinning? But the moment that you start to get better and you understand it, that's what you're responsible for. And so he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. They didn't know what was happening. But when the Holy Spirit starts to speak to you, now you're held accountable for it. So I ask you this question and you have some place to write on your paper. What has the Holy Spirit said to you? What is he speaking to you this morning? Maybe it's you need to be a part of something bigger. Maybe you need to come in and join us for growth track next week from 9 to 945. Maybe you need to join a small group because, you know, you, you got your own thoughts, but they're not that great. Or maybe you need to start spending a quiet time with God in the morning. Or maybe you need to start spending more time with your children. Or maybe you need to pull that, that pen and paper out and start back with that book. Maybe you need to be a little bit more caring or a little bit more loving. Maybe you need to be a little bit more timely. Maybe you should be a little bit graceful in your communication with other people. Maybe you should do things not out of selfish ambition, but out of love for other people. Maybe it's time for you to change it. And so this morning we have some people standing up here because we can't change it by ourselves, guys. I don't care how good you are, you can't do it by yourself. Because when you're doing stuff, you can't correct yourself if you don't know what you're doing. It's not right. And so this morning, if you know that that's you, you know that you need to.